Thank you, Amanda and Lua, for having me, and Geetanjali for being here, um, and everyone in the audience as well. I know we're all joining from different time zones, so um, thank you for taking the time to come. Uh, I'm going to quickly share my screen, and then we can we can start. Oops. You think I would have gotten better at Zoom being on Zoom for however long I've been on Zoom, but it refuses to let me share my screen for some reason. Okay, there we go. I think I finally got it. Um, okay, I do not know why it refuses to let me share anything. Okay, sorry. I'm gonna fix this very quickly because it is showing me no screen as soon as I shared my screen. Okay. Okay, maybe you're just gonna see it with my comments on the side. Okay, is everyone seeing something? Yeah, we that can is we can see your PowerPoint presentation, but yeah, we okay. can obviously no. it. it's not in presenter view, that's all. Oh, now it's in presenter view. Okay, amazing. Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, as Amanda mentioned, I am a PhD student at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, um, where I work on issues of gender and human security. Um, before I dive into the presentation, I just wanted to sort of put out some feelers and a, and a bit of a trigger warning to know that given the state of the world right now, I know we're all overwhelmed and maybe we don't want to talk about violence or hear about violence anymore. Um, I've tried to make sure that I don't actually talk about the specificities of any sorts of violence, but I'm trying to talk around the violence or talk about the aftermath of it in terms of activism and changes to the law. But if you need to take a break at any point, feel free to do so. Um, something that's really important to me is practices of care. So I don't wanna be hypocritical and say, you have to stay till the end or you have to make sure you you know pay attention. So if you need to take a break, please do that. Um, something that I think we can, we can sort of see, especially in the current moment, is that a lot of violence exists side by side with the activism and protest that comes in its aftermath. Um, I also think we all have this sense of deja vu sometimes in terms of the aftermath of certain incidents of violence about what now, why is it happening again? Why is it happening You know, in this current state? What do we do? Um, so I'm gonna quickly just start with an exercise that I do um, and have done. So if you've heard me give a variant of this presentation, you want, please don't answer. I'm talking to my Fletcher um, cohort who I can see are in the audience. Um, okay, this is a quote from, uh, from let's say a leading book on rape in India. And my question is, um, does anyone know when this was written? Um, so I'm gonna quickly read out the quote and if you wanna put in your answers in chat, um, please do. Um, rape is not only a crime against the person of a woman victim, it is a crime against the entire society. It destroys the entire psychology of a woman and pushes her into deep emotional crises. It is only by her sheer willpower that she rehabilitates herself in the society, which on coming to know of the rape looks down upon her in derision and contempt. Rape is therefore the most hated crime. Does anyone wanna take a stab at when this was written? This always gives me really interesting answers. So I'm, I'm excited to see what people say. Anyone? Okay, 1366, 2012. Um, yeah, 2012 is pretty close actually. It's from um, one of the like most well-known textbooks slash guides on the applause in India. And it was actually, I think published in 20, this version of it was published in 2017, but I think, yes, it did come out in 2012. So I think this sort of lays out the context here and sets the stage for how rape and sexual violence are understood in India. So from just this one quote, we get sort of to understand notions of shame and honor, um, 
and notions of patriarchy and what it means to be a victim of violence. Here, in this case, a female victim or a woman victim and sort of the heteronormativity around it as well. Um, yeah, so what am I gonna talk about today? Um, the United Nations actually says um, that incidents of rape and sexual violence in India are too many and too often. Um, so sort of shame, notions of shame and victim blaming and patriarchy sort of create an environment where gender and sexual violence is largely accepted. Um, changes in the law have only come in the aftermath of protest or public um, outcries to sort of spectacular or violent incidents of rape and sexual violence. Um, so by looking at sort of these high profile cases, I argue that um, not only has formal law sort of failed to reduce sexual violence, but the very drafting and the application of these laws sort of serves to protect the patriarchal nature of the state and society. Um, rape law therefore continues to sort of reflect India's patriarchal norms and the mere enactment of seemingly progressive laws does not necessarily lead to positive social impact. Um, I use the lens of slow violence here to explain the patriarchal nature of the law and its relationship to activism and, and protest. Um, in terms of a quick blurb on the methodology, it's a sort of case study approach. I looked through so-called landmark cases um, of rape adjudication, sexual violence, uh, sexual, sexual violence adjudication. I use sort of contextualism and feminist jurisprudence, which, is, which means essentially that I focus not only on the letter of the law, but also on the doctrinal, institutional, cultural, and social context in which laws are drafted, created, and applied. Um, but I also focus on the social norms and the attitudes that underpin these decisions and underpin these laws. Um, so before we get into sort of what, ha what is happening in current day India, um, it's important to look at what happened in colonial India because when India gained independence, we just took a chunk of the Indian penal code that existed in colonial India and it still sort of exists today and we uh, still use some variant of it largely similar to what happened or what existed in colonial India. So what happened then was that there were sort of two traditional authority structures that existed. One was a, a society where a patriarchal society where men were given predominance and second was the British colonial state as well. Um, so rape law in colonial India was based on the suspicion of women's claims and a presumed frequency of false charges and the so-called so peculiarity of the Indian culture. Um, we'll also notice that a lot of colonial laws penal code, but also which exists today is very heteronormative. There's an assumption that the victim is always a woman and that the perpetrator is always a man. Um, so what happened was that victims faced a sort of twofold challenge in courtrooms. Um, not only was it that there was a pres presumption of false charges, but there were also sort of colonial ideas about the unreliability of native witnesses. Um, so the onus of proof here was on the victim to prove that they were sexually assaulted, that they were raped. Um, there was a sort of a medical legal approach that was adopted to adjudicating these cases. And it was based on sort of four kinds of evidence that were needed for corroboration. Prior sexual history of the victim, not the perpetrator, the class and caste of the victim, um, immediacy of the complaint and signs of physical resistance. Um, and we'll see that a lot of this still perpetuates and exists today, not only in India and in, not only in lots of post-colonial states, but, but elsewhere as well. Um, so there was this specter of doubt that, that sort of existed around older women and women of lower caste. So um, in a lot of cases, I'm not gonna get into specificities for time, but happy to get into it in the Q&A. Um, you could see that in cases, if you, were younger, you were more likely to have the judge side with you. If you were of a higher caste, you were more likely to have the judge side with you. If there were sort of signs of physical resistance that proved non-consent, um, the better you were, were sort of helped and supported. And the immediacy of the complaint also mattered. Did you complain as soon as it happened? Did you take a couple of weeks? Um, what did that mean? 
uh, did that mean you made it up? Um, so the institutional treatment of rape was sort of contradictory. In, in the letter or on paper, punishments were harsh, but in practice, plaintiffs were rigorously interrogated. It was not necessarily the perpetrators or the defendants that were interrogated. The onus of proof again was on the victim to prove non-consent, to prove that um, they resisted, to prove that they were not in the wrong, that they were not sort of lying and making up things in the aftermath of consensual um, acts of sex. Um, in independent India then, as I said earlier, we just sort of took the scaffolding of the law that existed and put it into um, our constitution and into our penal code. Um, so I'm gonna talk through sort of five so-called landmark cases and what that did to change the law, um, if it did help to change the law. The first was the, was the Mathura case of 1979 or the Tukaram versus the state of Maharashtra. So what happened there was that a woman of a lower caste was, um, was raped in, in custody, in police custody. Um, she was acquitted, the victims, sorry, the defendants were acquitted by the Supreme Court due to the lack of physical evidence. Um, and this sort of rested on the notion that she was habituated um, to sex and had a loose moral character. I'm not gonna talk about the two finger test because I think it's disgusting, but it still exists. Um, but basically they, they, uh, she, the defendants were acquitted because of a, the, this sort of horrendous test called a two finger test that test can as, assumingly test whether or not you are a virgin or whether you are habituated to sexual, to sex and um, sex or not. So um, in the aftermath of this acquittal, there were large scale protests by feminist organizations throughout the country um, and there were amendments made to the law. Custodial rape was added as a, as a category of aggravated rape and the burden of proof shifted to the defendants. So it's only in 1979 that the burden of proof shifted. Um, the second case is the Hirjbai versus state of Gujarat case, which was in 1983. Um, here is really interesting to note that the Supreme Court said that corroboration is unnecessary, but this corroboration um, or this claim was based on a cultural claim that Indian women would not lie. Um, it, was, it was said that in the Indian context, in, um, corroboration is unnecessary because victims would not lie because they know the stigma and the shame that it would bring to their families. Um, ergo, they would not lie. Ergo, corroboration is unnecessary. Um, the next case was 96, um, which was the Gurmeet Singh case. Um, here, um, the victim was a young girl. She was below the age of 16. The lower court sort of dismissed the case because they said um, she was habituated and she had a loose character. You'll see that this notion of loose character and being habituated to sexual violence, to sex, not sexual violence, uh, comes up a lot. Um, so they said consent was immaterial. It went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said consent was immaterial because she was below the age of 16 um, and that there was a delay in filing because of the stigma that was associated. Again, this sort of cultural claim that there's a lot of stigma associated which is why the family waited and, and sort of complained later. Um, then in 2012, we have the Nirbhaya gang rape, uh, which led to the Justice Varma Committee and the Criminal Law Amendment of 2013. It broadened the definition of rape, increased the age of consent, um, added clauses and um, cases of aggravated rape. Um, and it also broadened the definition, interestingly, beyond heteronormative notions of sexual violence for the first time. Um, and then we have the Kathua and Unao rapes in 2017 and 2018, which led to <clears throat> the government making changes, adding a death penalty for rape of girls, again, not girls below the age of 12. It increased the minimum punishment of rape um, and there, were no there was no change in, in sort of rape for cap for, of boys. And as I said, this notion of capital punishment sort of perpetuated and increased. Um, Okay, so we're gonna talk through this through this lens of, of slow violence. So what is slow violence? Um, slow violence is a sort of concept that was come about by this scholar of the environmental humanities called Rob Nixon. 
So according to Rob Nixon, slow violence is violence that occurs gradually and is dispersed across space and time. Um, the sort of notions of unspectacular violence or unspectacularity are sort of kept out of sight. So the everyday reality of sort of slower forms of violence or these sort of unspectacular forms of violence go unnoticed. Um, the only time that we pay attention to these sort of forms of violence is when its impact is sensationalized. Um, so while structural violence, which is something we've talked about earlier, um, and has existed as a concept for a, for a few decades, is concerned primarily with issues of causation and agency. Slow violence also takes into consideration issues of temporality, representation, and scale. So um, Rob Nixon also notes the importance of writer activists. So he says that by highlighting the unspectacular and sort of rendering um, the invisible visible and representing representing the invisible, we can sort of overcome this representational bias against slow violence. Um, okay, so what are the layers of violence here and what does it mean in terms of slow violence? Um, so one is that this largely medical legal approach that we've taken to rape sort of downplays the gendered relations of power that exist. And what it does is makes um, sexual violence treatable. Um, innocence is sort of makes a victim worthy. And the onus here again is on proving non-consent. Um, as I said earlier, um, in terms of representation and the invisibility here, um, there's a hierarchy of victims and who counts as a victim or a casualty. Um, so writer activists here have an important role in sort of amplifying marginal voices and highlighting um, and highlighting these cases of slow violence. So in terms of the layers of violence is there's multiple layers, not only the acts of violence that matter in terms of the sexual violence, but also um, the violence that exists in terms of being rendered invisible, being rendered um, to be un, unworthy of attention or unworthy of, of a response. It's being sidelined um, as well as sort of being constrained by these structures of the state and the law that see you in certain ways or see your um, victimhood or violence or your status based on issues of onus of proof and consent. So this sort of symbiotic relationship between the state, society, and culture to sort of uphold patriarchy creates this sort of gendered um, landscape or this gender scape of hate. So the patriarchal nature of the law is unspectacular because its workings are not sensational or hyper-visible. The only time that we pay attention to the law or we pay attention to sexual violence is when its impact is sensationalized. Um, so if we look back to that slide on independent India and that timeline, it was those cases that, that were so grotesque or so violent that they led to public protest and public outcry and activists showing up on the streets that it led to some change in the law. So it's only when it seems so in your face and so um, apparent that this form of violence exists that we are ready to make, that the state and the, and the judiciary are ready to make some change. But even then, even when this change is made and so-called made progressive or made better, it's still um, run through patriarchal notions or it's still um, party to patriarchal notions about shame, stigma, um, non-consent and things like that. So the prosecution then of banal crimes that could sort of address underlying social, economic and political challenges or cultural challenges are sidelined by more evil crimes. So we see that in the aftermath of the Nepal case with the death, um, with capital punishment, that was the focus like, oh, now, now that we have capital punishment and these few bad apples are, got, have gotten rid of, we've gotten rid of them, now we can move on with, we can move on as a society or we can move on as a country. But we see that that doesn't necessarily change anything because we're focusing on these few bad apples rather than the larger scaffolding at play that exists that creates a society that is accepting of certain forms of violence, whether or not it is, uh, whether or not it is seen as spectacular or not. So reforms have been instituted on the back of these sort of high profile cases that received a lot of public scrutiny. 
So there's a flurry of state responsiveness with legal reforms, fast track cases, harsh punishments, but these follow long periods of inaction and status quo. And again, the focus here is on these spectacular cases of sexual violence. It's not on the everyday forms of violence that exist in a patriarchal society. It's not on Eve teasing, which is a catch all term that we use in South Asia for violence. It's not on sort of sitting on a bus and being groped. It's not about um, being a 10 year old child standing on the street and having someone blow kisses at you repeatedly. It's not on sort of policing, having to police yourself in the aftermath of these violent, cases of violence and sexual violence. It's not about the victims or the potential victims having to police themselves. Um, so another layer of violence that exists here is coverage of sexual assault and rape. It's limited. It doesn't engage, again, with the root causes of violence in society, same that the law doesn't, the media coverage doesn't. It sort of focuses either on banal crime briefs, which are sort of matter of fact, or sensationalized stories in terms of the breaking news, the Arnab Goswamis of the world screaming in your face um, that this is something to think about. It usually also engages in shaming the victim as the media continues to be plagued by patriarchal attitudes because if a society is patriarchal, its institutions are going to be patriarchal as well. It's largely focused again in terms of a representational bias on assaults or violence against urban English speaking middle class and upper caste women. So not only is it creating sort of marginalized um, groups in its focus in terms of whose rapes matter and whose sexual violence matters and who counts as a victim. It's also, again, as I said, um, creating people whose voices are not heard or whose sexual violence doesn't matter as much as others because it wasn't spectacular enough or it wasn't um, gruesome or grotesque enough. Um, again, here, as you can see, the focus again is very, very heteronormative. Um, I can see that I'm already at 20 minutes. So I'm gonna just speed through the rest, um, which is just one more slide. Um, so it's noticing essentially when we look at sexual violence and the sort of slow violence of all of it is what is seen and what is made possible or what is visible when we widen our focus and frame. So this is part of a larger project, uh, which is my dissertation, which is about how sexual activism around sexual violence sorry, feminist activism around sexual violence is undertaken and sustained during these periods of low public attention. So is, is the form of activism different? Is it when we have high public attention, we're focusing on changing the law and sort of larger structures at play? And is it then when we have low periods of, of um, public attention, we're focusing on more on the ground grassroots programming and behavioral change or, or how we report about violence in media toolkits? Um, and related to that is how activists sustain themselves and each other while working on these issues of that are sensitive and dramatic and where change is slow. When change seems like we know what needs to be done, but it isn't getting done. And what is the sort of burden that exists when you're working on something that is heavy and that you know needs change, but isn't getting changed. So um, the project then is about sustaining not only a movement towards um, activism and change around sexual violence, but being able to sustain ourselves as well. So the focus is not, not only on responses to sexual violence, but sort of practices of care that exist around it as well. Um, and I'm happy to chat about that further. Um, finally, here is, if you've seen Twitter, you know this hullabaloo that's happening around um, whether citation matters and academic writing and narrative. So here is a brief bibliography. Um, because I think it's important to, to sort of note whose work I'm drawing on and whose work I want to be in conversation with. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna stop now. So if you have any questions, um, happy to take them. If you have any comments, I'm happy to hear them. Um, I think I'll stop sharing now so that I can see everyone better and not just staring at my own presentation. Thank you so much, Dipali, for an amazing presentation. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll we'll get the floor over to Jitanjali now to to comment. And if people want to ask questions, also please feel free to do them on the chat. 
or on the Q&A or maybe later raise your hand. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity to be able to comment on such a brilliant presentation. Um, it's great. Um, I really enjoyed uh, hearing you speak today, Dipali, but also I had the pleasure of reading your chapter in advance. So I had an advantage there. So I really enjoyed it. The things that I particularly liked about your presentation and your chapter are, I like the way that you use the concept of slow violence. And I think it's really good way to think about the ways in which um, the violence that women experience not only through sexual abuse and sexual violence on a day-to-day -day basis is normalized, and it's normalized because of the way that the what might be seen or what are considered extreme cases of violence are highlighted. So the everyday cases then become even more unremarkable, as it were. Um, I was wondering, though, within that, whether you were were, were considering using Veena Das's ideas again, of critical events as well. Um, I myself have used it around issues around sexual violence, and I've chosen um, the, the Mathura rape case, the Bhavri Devi rape case, and the, uh, the obviously the, uh, the Jyoti Singh rape case as well, particularly because of the way in which it has led to changes in law. And that's what I've pinned it to. And I'm not suggesting for a minute that you do that because that's unnecessary. But in you might consider using the broader concept of uh, critical events, though you already might have considered it and discarded it for very good reasons. Um, I was also thinking that when you are talking about the development of feminist activism around these issues um, and thinking about the development of rape law, you could also consider looking at the development of rape judgments. In, in, when you started speaking, when you talked about deja vu, it particularly spoke to me because I Part of me, whenever I hear about another rape case in India, I think my first response is it's happened again and again and again and again, and it never stops. And the more it changes, the more it seems to happen. And it has a sort of repetition in a way which is kind of can be quite um, soul destroying, if you like, particularly for activists, but even for people who are researching on the subject or reading on the subject. And that then becomes one of the reasons why people don't want to talk about it, because it becomes almost emotionally too much, uh, if you like. So the re repetition of violence and the repetition of narrations, which means that the, ev the really important testimonies of the so-called everyday acts of violence get lost within that, because actually there's no space in which we might hear them, if you like. I also liked how you put together shame, honor, and victim blaming, but also celebration of the perpetrator. That kind of goes hand in hand, and that we can see that in some of the cases around the sort of Me Too movement, uh, where you, you've got um, this, the perpetrator being excused and celebrated in, in different ways almost. And actually, it, you know, there was a late, there's a tweet I read recently about somebody looking at where some, of, you know, because the idea that, of course, the sort of naming of people in the B2 movement was unfair because it doesn't follow due process. It doesn't follow, um, you know, and it's just basically, what's the word for it? It, um, it destroys reputations. It can destroy the lives of men, but actually this tweet has brought us looked at how actually not much has changed for the men. It, but the sort of 
alleged perpetrators, but they've actually been doing quite well. So that kind of thing about how the shame of speaking out, it's victim blaming, but when women speak out, they're then shamed for speaking out about something like this. Um, also like the idea of contextual jurisprudence and the importance of culture and structure within that, you talked about heteronormativity within law, and of course, that's really, really important. I was wondering, and this is a direct question for you, Dipali, you talk about it. I would just like to, you to elaborate a little bit more on how you think, how and why, in your opinion, that is a problem. And do you believe that feminists have um, addressed this adequately? or not in the Indian context. So that's one of the things that I'd like you to uh, perhaps talk about a little bit if you can or think about whatever, like, you know, uh, the temporality of slow violence really, really important. Another thing that perhaps you may like to consider is the Me Too movement uh, and the activism around that. And I just wonder whether you believe that the, the listing out or the speaking out of women in the sort of, I found it particularly moving during the Me Too, uh, you know, the times when women were, all they were doing was putting Me Too with a hashtag on their Facebook and Twitter page. And I, I thought that was in incredibly powerful and moving. And I was wondering whether that has changed the slow violence discourse or whether it has something like that has the potential to change the slow violence discourse where it becomes ap apparent how endemic this problem is and speaking out about it, even though you get shamed for speaking out becomes could be in itself become an act of resistance and we're not doing it alone. Um, the last point, again, around um, sustaining and caring, so caring for each other, caring for the activists. So within that, of course, there's self-care um, and the issues around vicarious trauma, but also for uh, the, for you know, uh, the caring for people who are working in the sector, how do they take care of themselves? Um, even more of an issue sometimes, of course, when it comes to online activism, because that can be, uh, you know, doing the sort of online work can be really awful and, and can feel really difficult being attacked by strangers or even people you know. Uh, and there's always a lot of potential for misunderstanding. So how do we speak to each other in online spaces in a way that's actually supportive? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I just wanted to give you a few things to think about. So I hope they've been useful. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, Amanda, do you want me to take a few minutes to respond or do we want to open up to audience yeah, no, participation. Yeah, it's probably take a few minutes to respond and then we've got a few questions, but maybe that'll give the audience a bit warm up time to ask if they have a few. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Gitanjali, thank you so much for your comments. Um, I don't know if you could see, but while you were talking, I was literally shaking and I still kind of am because I feel very nervous when I'm getting feedback because I think someone is just going to tell me they hate everything I do that I don't they're just like leave please leave now so I'm happy happy that you gave me constructive feedback and I think it's important to get constructive feedback from people everywhere um, because it shows you that we all think completely differently and we have different ways of approaching things um, in terms of using <clears throat> Veena Das's work, I, I do, I didn't use it in, in, in this presentation um, because I sort of use slow violence as a framing, framing concept here, but I think you're right in sort of use, using the notion of critical events because I think it is tied to whether or not, it's sort of tied to the spectacularity of violence in a sense, or into these like sort of conjectures or, or inflection points that we see in terms of changing the law. Um, I completely get you when you said it's sort of soul destroying to do this work and to not only as an activist, but as a researcher as well. And 
thinking about sort of the spaces where we can we can sort of give each other time to accept what we're doing or but also give each other a break from it is really important and um when you talked about sort of care and vicarious trauma and second hand trauma this this came to my mind so initially my phd was only about the first question it was only about um sort of how activism sustains itself when there's not sort of public attention or public momentum to do things but in the space of the last couple of years doing this research on a day to day basis um through a pandemic um it sort of brought to light issues of okay if i am someone who researches this and doesn't actually talk to people about violence or about specific kinds of violence on a day to day basis or is not dealing with victims of violence on a day to day basis and i feel so burnt out by it and i feel so upset by it how must an activist feel or how must a victim who potentially could turn into an activist or has turned into an activist feel and that's when i sort of came upon this growing literature of of you know sort of an ethic of care and it sort of struck me that it sort of is related the momentum or the lack of momentum and the violence that we're seeing or the ones that we're talking about is related to what we put into the movement and if we're not able to in terms of um in terms of the analogy of putting on your oxygen mask first before helping someone else if i'm not able to put on my own oxygen mask i'm not going to be able to make much change not only for others but also for myself so um i definitely see the two as related the kinds of activism we can do the kinds of change we can create related to whether or not we can sustain ourselves and take care of ourselves in doing so and i and i'm also thinking about when you said notions of self care but also thinking beyond sort of these neoliberal assumptions of self care and and what it means to deal with community care and to deal with okay this is a structural thing that we're told to keep going that productivity matters that not only in academia of course but in a capital capitalistic society that productivity is what sort of defines our worth what does it mean then to take a break to have to say no it's important that i take time for myself or i take time for x y and z to support them through this um I, when you talked about the celebration of the perpetrator and sort of the excuses that we make for perpetrators it it did get me thinking about that twitter thread that you were talking about about if i if i if i am getting it right the sort of oh these people were named and shamed they went out of the limelight for a little while but now they're back with their own netflix comedy specials or they're back to directing movies or they're back to you know winning their ballon d'or um best footballer of the year things um is yes there's there's in this patriarchal notion or in this patriarchal society there is this tendency to sort of celebrate the perpetrator and excuse them at times as well because oh they're you know they're a cricketer or oh they're a bollywood superstar that you know brings money into um an industry or brings money in terms of tourism or things like that and so this is definitely something i think i need to do more on in terms of adding that this is another layer of slow violence this is the fact that we're allowing certain people to continue doing what they do while in a sense it is victims or potential victims who are then policing themselves uh, or having to police themselves um in terms of heteronormativity um and whether feminist activism has done a good job i'm not sure if feminist activism has done a good job i think this because of the way the indian feminist movement exists in terms of this gap between what happens in delhi with the middle class to upper class um mostly women um engaging in activism as opposed to the more rural or non delhi activists um i think there's a divide in terms of what they care about but also in terms of movements not learning from each other or learning with each other um and i'm thinking through um the sodomy laws and what that also meant and how much we could learn from each other i think there's some acceptance now that that the law is heteronormative but i also think given our current 
moment. Um, I think it's easier to sort of say, we're going to put that on the back burner and focus on things that will bring more coalition building. And if I remember right, I saw Sheila in the audience now, and I know that she has this notion of assemblages and protest assemblages. And what does it mean to then create coalition with people that don't necessarily see things the same way, but may have similar goals in mind? So what does it mean to have a right-leaning activists that think violence against women is bad, but may not see the patriarchal notion of all of that? And what does it mean that they're willing to sort of strengthen the law, which in most senses means make punishment harsher, um, but do not see that other forms of violence, which are not centered around the women and are not just heteronormative exist. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely something that I'm gonna be thinking about. Um, and lastly um, is, is the notion of being online and what it means in terms of activism. I think it's definitely become easier for people to name and shame, but also to, to sort of claim their identity or claim what happened to them online through an, an anonymity, but also otherwise. But I think there's also a flip side, which is, and in the lead up to this, this was my, my number one fear, was that a lot of trolls would just turn up to the Zoom event and be telling me, things about the work that I do because it, it's 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 a harsh reality that I'm I think a lot of us feel in researching sort of feminist issues and researching certain things that the minority the minority majority in our country but also I think across the world think is not worthy of attention or is not worthy of um, importance and what that means in terms of policing ourselves again. And I think it all comes back to that notion of having to police ourselves or police others' behavior when it's not resting on what perpetrators do, but on what victims or potential victims can or cannot do. Um, I think I'll stop there because I know there are questions, but thank you. Thank you. It's a really good response, thank you. Uh, yes, we have a few questions, Dipali. I think one of them you started to answer in this sense of how do you go, you know, about extensively writing, reading and doing research on rape and sexual violence while making sure to care for yourself. That's a question from Amberin. And I might, I'm, I'm going to go through some of the questions and then you can, you can give some, some comments on whatever you want. Uh, also, Sinduja uh, is thanking you for this amazing presentation. She, uh, Sinduja loves the use of Nixon's slow violence to discuss the uns unspectacular aspects of gender violence. Uh, I'm going to summarize. So Sinduja wants to know, wondering if, if or slash uh, how you are thinking about the slow burning impacts of the law, laws themselves. Um, Dipti is also thanking you <laughs> for this fascinating conversation. It's a really different way to engage with these realities of violence in India. Dipti is also uh, thinking about being an activist researcher uh, and is wondering how we can engage with this from the non-landmark silenced realities, uh, say such as the rape cases in places with uh, AFSPA and militarization in the peripheries. And finally, Srila uh, um, is also thanking you and Jitanjali. Um, Srila would love to know a bit about the anti-gender based violent activists, activisms you have in mind. Who are they and how do they engage in their everyday work? Uh, the different temporalities of violence, slow, spectacular, and taking care of others as well as the self. Uh, also amazing questions. Thank you, everyone. The floor is yours, Pauli. Um, thank you, everybody, for the helpful comments and questions. Uh, I'm gonna, I know I'm looking at the time, and I know that I don't have much time, so I'm gonna quickly try to go through these things. But if I can't, I, I'm happy to chat further, slash email, slash send, you know, carrier pigeons to each other. Um, the first question on term, in terms of dealing with writing about and doing research on rape and sexual violence, how do I go about it? not, I think it depends on the day. I think some days I'm 
much better at creating distance and knowing that I need to take a break and some days not so much. Um, I highly recommend therapy. Um, I think as a graduate student, but also as someone researching sexual violence, I, I think it is very helpful, but I know that it, obviously therapy is paid and it's not necessarily reachable to most people, um, but to find practices that help you. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but one of the previous slides had an illustration that I did. That is something that has really helped me is taking time and sort of illustrating through my thoughts and feelings. My dream is one day to publish a graphic novel, but I think that may be asking for too much at this point. At this point, I just need to finish my dissertation. Um, I think the importance of community is really central to, to sort of making sure you care for yourself and take breaks. Um, but this is something I think about a lot and keep having to change whether or not based on the day, whether or not I'm dealing with it well or dealing with it poorly or not as well. Um, Sindhuja's question on sort of the deadly impacts that are sustained over time. Um, yeah, I think there's a, obviously a slow burning impact to the law or the, I guess, lack of law in some cases or the poor adjudication of law. Um, and I think that that leads again, as I mentioned, um, to, I guess, people policing themselves. And usually it becomes potential victims and victims policing themselves, whether that means they have a growing distrust in the state and the law, whether it means, you know, carrying pepper spray in your bag every time you leave or policing yourself in terms of, oh, I'm not gonna go out alone at this time of night or things like that. I think that is something that sustains itself, but I think also, the impact is also that there's a lot of burnout. There's a lot of sort of discomfort or unhappiness around doing this work or wanting to change the law and then seeing it not changed. And that leads to people not knowing what to do with this state of, it can get better so easily or in, in concrete ways, but we're just not doing it. And I think that is an impact as well of slow violence that it just makes it harder and harder to create change. Um, what are the other questions? Um, I wonder how we can um, engage with non-landmark silence realities. Yes, um, I did a poor job of explaining it, but um, in the chapter slash paper, I also talk about um, sort of this notion of borderlands and who is a worthy victim and the fact that in cases of AFSPA where, or marital rape. The fact that when these people may not even be allowed to claim victimhood is a kind of silence or is a kind of violence in and of itself that certain people matter more or are deemed more worthy of attention than others. Um, and I think that falls well into this notion of this representational bias that exists because of slow violence. Um, I see Sheila's question in terms of who are they and how do they engage. Um, so I sort of, in my dissertation, work backwards on the methodology of this. Um, <laughs> given the pandemic, I haven't been actually able to do fieldwork and I'm hoping finally now to start fieldwork in the next couple of months. And I, um, because I think I sort of come from the notion that for a long time, feminists thought changing the law would, would sort of create lasting impact and would make a change. That's how I started. It looks at organizations that, that's, that work on legal reform or work with victims in the judiciary or around their cases and then do other things as well. Um, but I'm also very cognizant of the fact that a lot of the focus on feminist activism around sexual violence in India has been on these sort of Delhi middle-class to upper-class women or super hyper-local rural cases of it. Whereas we've not thought enough about other cities or other uh, parts of the country where one, we're not getting attention in terms of sexual violence that happens there or that the focus is on other forms of activism or other forms of, of violence. Uh, I'm gonna quickly move on to the other question, but I'm happy to chat about the sort of the sampling of all of this, um, because I'm hoping that it will be a interpretive ethnographic study. 
so it's going to take me some time but uh, i'm also currently in the process of my iib finally so um there's a lot of moving parts around here but i'm happy to chat further um i keep returning to the question who merits and who does not merit feminist solidarity and indeed how does that relate to hierarchies of victimhood yes roxani's work is amazing in case anyone hasn't read it i highly recommend it um and she went to fletcher um not all victims of sexual violence are equal or treated equally and who makes up the sphere of feminist activism um in terms of hierarchies of victimhood definitely i think there's something i speak about in terms of the representational i guess bias of all of it but also knowing then the because the focus is on spectacularity that if you are a victim of this sort of spectacular violence you are able to claim the victimhood um space but also the space that that creates in terms of getting attention or being worthy of being named or being given space um in beyond that yes it's clear that people are not treated equally that obviously we focus here on sexual violence is on the gruesome sexual assault um rape but not on the more banal forms of you know banal but not really banal forms of of um slut shaming that exist in terms of trolling or or in terms of policing someone what someone wears or um or you know the the uncomfortable glances you get on buses and things like that so i think there definitely is a victimhood in terms of uh, the hierarchy sorry in terms of who makes up the spheres of feminist activism and how they're positioned and networked um this is something that i um sort of thinking about actively um and struggling with a little bit because i think i'm cognizant of the fact that i don't want to name someone a feminist group or a feminist activist then when they may not necessarily be but also knowing that there is these sort of uneasy coalitions that exist for example between you know right wing groups that think they can police women's behavior and ergo want changes to the law but are not feminist um and to me i guess the question in terms of feminist activism always comes back to looking at whether they're looking at gendered notions of power and gendered notions of violence and whether that exists and i'm very clear or very cognizant of the fact that that may differ from person to person um but also that hopefully it means in terms of internal validity as long as i can justify that they are feminist activists in my understanding that that may be good for now <laughs> i think that was a very bad way to answer the question but thank you for giving me something to think about something more to think about um well you did a wonderful job answering <laughs> this very tough questions <laughs> i'm glad i gave you something else to think about um amanda do we have anything else can that you like to to share no other than i'm sad we're running out of time um cuz this is a uh, such an important conversation and difficult one to have and you know i thank you to polly and you also uh kitan jolly and you know people who do this sort of work it's certainly not easy um but it's really important and uh i look forward to seeing your work in publication um form 2 um and just uh deep gratitude to both of you for coming and being a part of the seminar series and also for the audience for coming along and asking those important questions so i've said bye peace well i'll pass it over to you Thank you. Thank you once again, uh, Dipali, Gijantali, and everyone who joined us. Uh, I shared on the chat uh, a little bit earlier today the FTGS Twitter, the website, and also the following series that we have for the Global Voice Seminar. Uh, you know, please uh, follow us and, and come to the following uh, seminars that we're going to have. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dipali, for such an honest and open and, and 
and truth share and everything that you exposed <laughs> uh, here today. Thank you, Gijantali, for your time and comments. And thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a good rest of the day, afternoon, or a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming and taking the time. Thank you.